let's start talking about hypertrophy. As a fighter, you have a weight class that you fight in. Okay? So know what your weight class is to figure out how big or not big you want to be. I am strongly opposed and do not advocate cutting weight. There's a difference between cutting weight and losing weight. What I'm talking about is the guys who dehydrate themselves, starve themselves, and cut weight, weigh in at an anorexic or manorexic weight, and then rehydrate themselves, rehydrate themselves, with fucking needles and sports drinks and whatever else, and then try and perform up. Just the dehydration aspect has such a negative impact on speed, power, mental focus. I don't understand how it became the thing to do. But boxers do it, wrestlers do it, MMA guys do it. They starve themselves, which starving is dying, kind of the opposite of what we're doing. <laughs> we're trying for optimal performance for the system to work best. Train optimally, don't cut weight. Know what your weight is. Know what weight class you're going to fight at. Then, start going through this pyramid. You can be a little bit heavy during the hypertrophy phase. You'll lean out as you get closer to the fight. Being eight weeks out and gradually losing weight is different than being two weeks out. Sucking weight down, losing it, and then rehydrating. Does everyone understand the difference between losing weight and cutting weight? The reason it's important to decide this is my weight class is because it's going to determine how much hypertrophy you can or can't have. Once you make that choice, you want as much muscle and as little fat as you can reasonably maintain. So most athletes it's four or five percent body fat. Impossible to measure except with autopsy, which I don't recommend. You want to be bigger, stronger, leaner. The other reason I advocate hypertrophy, all the research has shown that whatever strength gains you make, you maintain longer if it's built on a base of hypertrophy. This is with elite athletes, this is with neophytes, this is with grandma, it doesn't matter. If you do strength training and you first build the both sarcomeric and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, if you increase your mass, you will maintain your strength gains longer than if you just do plyometrics and if you just do head, uh, strength training, if you just do complex training. If you increase your intensity of exercise, you will increase your strength, you will increase your performance. You will not maintain it as long unless it's built on a good, solid foundation of hypertrophy. Because of the nerve jerk reaction, and this happened in martial arts, or uh, MMA also, hey, you take a look back at Pride. <laughs> take a look back at 2099, a couple decades ago, right? Everyone was juicing out of their minds. Everyone was. And they started realizing the limitations of hypertrophy training and the risks. Okay? So, the benefit, what's the benefit of hypertrophy? Strength. Strength endurance. And a foundation that maintains your strength and power longer than anything else. The risk of hypertrophy. To train hypertrophy but optimally, you need to eliminate or reduce inertia and momentum. Kind of the opposite of what we're looking for. We want to control, instigate, create explosivity, inertia, momentum, kinetic energy. Bah! That's what we want, right? But, to build hypertrophy, you need to mitigate those things. So, there's a hypertrophy phase. However, hypertrophy training, because you are controlling the more dangerous aspects of weight training, which are inertia, 
momentum, ballistics. Um, hypertrophy training is actually safer than strength training or power training. Less joint impact. So, the further out you are, the more time you spend in hypertrophy training. The optimal formula for hypertrophy training The problem with optimal is you, it implies that this is the only way to do it. It's not. Pretty much any strength training you do, your muscles are going to grow and you're going to get stronger. But if your focus is to gain muscle mass and strength and strength endurance, the variables that you need to control uh, that is often overlooked is the speed of the repetition, the momentum. Okay? So you're going to use a lighter weight and a six second repetition. This sounds crazy to fighters, and it is, which the problem. People are doing hypertrophy training and then not re-educating the muscle to be explosive. So they're making it stronger and they're building strength and endurance. Hey, but they weren't converting it to power. So this pyramid is build your strength, build your strength and endurance, teach that strength to be faster and more explosive, and then make it even more explosive. So we go strength, endurance, hypertrophy, strength, power. So the six second repetition, if I'm doing bench press and I'm laying on my back, literally it's one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, you don't want to stick at the end points. You don't want to go one two, <laughs> and rest at the bottom or rest at the top. There's the weight's balanced here, the weight's pretty much balanced here, right? So you want constant tension and you want pretty much constant movement. That's very slow. Okay? What we've done is now you are training with the mass of the weight and mitigating the inertia. The formula for optimal hypertrophy is a six second repetition. In the eight to 12 rep range, three sets per exercise, five to 10 exercises per session, four to six sessions a week. This is high volume, and it's something you work your way up to. So, where you increase is with the, ex the number of exercises. Also, hypertrophy training is where most everyone has a, a foundation of, a strong knowledge of, whether they know it or not. If you've been educated in resistance training or weightlifting, in America, in the past 20, 30 years, this is what most people have been educated in. So, uh, if I say bench press, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, bench press is one exercise for chest, anterior delt, and tricep. The way you work your way up is you start with one exercise. Do three reps in the rep range at the tempo. The way you increase it is you increase the number of exercises. Five to ten exercises per session. Try to avoid going more than a minute, a minute and fifteen of actual work. A mistake that people make is they train in the gym too long and you start getting diminished returns because of stress hormones. Shoot up. Cortisol levels increase, go off the charts. After about 
an hour, we'll say about an hour, of work. So that doesn't mean an hour in the gym, because much of that time is resting between sets, shooting the shit with the guy next to you, right? It means, okay, so if I'm following this, this formula of six second repetitions, that one set is a minute and 20 seconds of work. Yeah? yeah? With me? Okay. For hypertrophy, rest between sets can be slower or smaller, right? So 30 seconds to a minute because the intensity is low. So you're using relatively lighter weights and trying to mitigate or eliminate momentum and inertia. So the intensity is, is, is low. Compared to what we do, compared to what we're training, it's the lowest intensity that we're actually going to get, aside from drill and skill. How much weight do you use? Most research is done in a percentage of one, one rep max. For hypertrophy training, because it's the least specific of what we do, you can be fairly fuzzy. You don't have to go, oh, 80% of the one rep max. If you're paying attention to the tempo, which is actually the most important thing, and, well, can you do eight reps? If not, it's too heavy. Can you do more than 12? You're wasting your time. Okay? You want to use probably a 12 or 13 rep max and do your training with, within those parameters, if it's 12 reps. Yeah. The variables are the momentum and whatever parameters you set up for the exercise, whatever you can do appropriately. Yeah, so what's your max is what you're asking. And for hypertrophy training, it really is, you know, is this? You're, uh, yeah, are you much much looking for like momentary muscle failure on the last rep? If you're actually going to go out and say, this is my 12 rep max, yeah. But you can what I'm saying is you can fail up until that point, somewhere yeah. between eight and yeah. Oh, during the set? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But if you're trying to find out what your max is, which yeah. is going to change yeah. when the wind blows, right? Right. But yeah, you can train to momentary muscle failure, or you can train right before it. Okay. Right? And with hypertrophy training, you don't really, because momentary muscle failure is mostly neurological, you're actually looking to train the sarcomeres or the protein of the muscle, or the muscles, not the nerves. So you're not actually going to reach true failure, but you'll start getting that shape, and you'll start losing, and that's part of the reason why the form is like preached, and da, 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 right? So again, I'm giving you the optimal formula, but what happens if you use a five-second five repetition? You still get bigger and stronger. Well, what if you use a heavier weight and move just a little bit slow, or a little bit faster? Still going to get bigger and stronger. Formula focuses on the motor units that have the most potential for hypertrophy. So it's going to be slow twitch, intermediate, and half your intermediate twitch. Or I can't say half. The science is so vague. But it's going to Hypertrophy, the motor units that are most available for hypertrophy. The fastest of the fast switch, they don't really hypertrophy. Most people, most people never find them, never access them, ever in their life. Off the subject, but on the subject, uh, Senior citizens, they did strength testing on a senior citizen and the norm for the American, whatever test group they used, a uh, sitting down and standing up was a one rep max. For people over 65, the average American can sit down and stand up, unloaded, that's a one rep max. They also, did their vertical jump six inches? Coincidence?
coincidentally, or incidentally, the, the most elite marathon runners, their vertical jump is about 68 inches. So that ties back into why we want to stay away from LSD. LSD is long, steady distance. Also, lysiric, whatever acid. I don't recommend either of them for what we do.